Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, and welcome to Book Club Blind Entry, a podcast for the Reading Room CLE. My name is Casey, and I am your host. Every week, I will read a book in its entirety and also do research into the background of the book and the background of the author. I will then send my co-host an excerpt that is 10 to 20 pages long without any information about the book whatsoever other than the text itself. We will then try to reconcile our differing perspectives to see whether one socially distanced excerpt can change the meaning of the entire book. Today, my guest is Grandpa Dave. Hi, I'm Grandpa Dave. Hi, Grandpa Dave. What kind of books do you normally read? Usually I read uh, mystery thrillers. I'm quite taken with science fiction. And occasionally I read historical, you know, like I just got through reading The Life of Theodore Roosevelt. I I like history as much as the others, but there's far more fiction that's enjoyable than there are history books. What about fiction holds its appeal to you? Well, it's when you're 78 years old and you're trying to figure out what to do from 8 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. Reading is a time filler. Yes, but fiction over nonfiction, though. It's just a hell of a lot more interesting. (laughs) It really is. I mean, uh, if you have a good fiction writer, now history is interesting and a lot of the facts you pick up are interesting. But there's there's just not a whole lot of people producing good history books that at least I find interesting. Fiction I read is contemporary fiction. When I'm reading something that is is not fi- that is what's the opposite of fiction? Nonfiction. Yeah, well, cool. That's a little cool. Whoever put that together was clever. Nonfiction. When I'm reading nonfiction, um. I I lost my train of thought, but, you know, I'm going to read history. Yeah. It's uncanny. You would really like historical nonfiction because the author of this book actually describes her plot as historical in how indelible it is. I found this quote from her in an online film news source called The Collider. It's a transcribed interview by Steve Weintraub. She said she refused to change the plot for her editors. She had already written maybe four out of the five books of the series that this is a part of, and her editors wanted her to make changes to it. And she's like, no, this is as real to me as history. I'm not doing shit. She's truly delusional. You think she's delusional? Yeah, completely. (laughs) What a nimrod. (laughs) All right. So now we're going to get into the segment where you talk about your experience of the text. So why are you describing her as a Nimrod? Well, I mean, if she's so tied to this, remember, I've read 10 pages, so I don't know how much of a flair I have for what she was trying to accomplish with this extraordinary piece of literature. But from what I was able to grab out of it, you got a bunch of, um, they're either werewolves or... They're not human-human. They take human form, but they've lived previous lives, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's the star of the show, I guess, Bella. So we're listening to the story through her eyes primarily. And she's really about as sharp as any doorknob I've ever seen. You know, in the intro to the plot, she actually is a straight-A student and takes multiple AP courses. What do you think of that? That's the cool thing about writing fiction. This turns out to be science fiction. She could talk the way she does in the novel and then supposedly get A's in school. Wow, that is really fictional. (laughs) So this is a component of why you would describe this author as a Nimrod. Correct. Were there any other questionable parts that you noticed? Uh, first of all, and it's it's a shame, but I have a, a natural avoidance. I mean, when I start reading a novel and I find out that somebody has lived before or it has come down from Mount Olympus yeah. or any of those things, I can't close that book fast enough and get to something else that I know I would enjoy more. I mean, I'm lucky I got through the 10 pages you gave me because I normally <laughs> would have just turned it off. But anyway, being the good grandfather I am, I decided to go through with this thing. Um, what was the question? I wanted to know whether there were any other parts of it, aside from the main characters, I guess, very dull perspective that you found questionable. 
Well, the baseball game was stupid. Why don't you summarize the plot of the excerpt? Because the readers don't know what's going on. Okay, okay so there's this uh, girl, Bella. Oh, there's this a, a group of <laughs> weirdos. <laughs> Actually, they're, I don't know what they are, but they are, you know, they're not humans. They've, they've got supernatural powers. They've lived lives previously. You can pull that out of the, the little bit that I read. And they have super strength and they can run faster than the wind. And oh my God, it just got so exciting. I damn near fell asleep in the middle. Um, is there anything like specific that happens towards the end of your excerpt? Well, yeah, then it started getting really dangerous. I almost woke up because three other of these strange people running through the woods and smelled them or heard them, they were all kind of concerned that if they, if these three strangers went into hunter mode, that it would be dangerous to Bella because Bella, apparently not being a weirdo, couldn't um, protect herself from these kinds of people. You know, if you rewrote this book in your own verbiage and you renamed the people you're referring to as weirdos instead of what they are described as, I would really read this book. I, re I really would. You see, I really should have been an author rather than a reader. I, I've always felt that way. But, you know, fate has taken me in a different direction. <laughs> you still got time. No, I don't. <laughs> So in another interview for The Guardian, this time with Kira Cotrain, she said that she wrote the book in three months. I can't believe it took her that long. <laughs> I mean, in the time it took her to write this book, the Cotrain article said that her kids constantly had colic and ear infections. So the author says, quote, I just didn't sleep for six years. Um, so this is when she had the time to write. Did the kids survive? Oh, yeah. They're all very healthy individuals i'm assuming they're three boys <laughs> no no i'm afraid of picking on the poor mother but if this is her life if this must represent the book must represent some feelings in her life that she wanted to get down on paper or something i truly would love to meet her children in the weintraub interview she said she wrote this book based on a dream that she had oh a dream okay i won't even comment <laughs> <laughs> i won't say it was lucid but it was very concretely established in her mind and she woke up she had this burning need she was like i'm gonna record this dream and she wasn't sure whether bella dies actually in the book so she wrote to find out do you think she's gonna die Ooh, bella yeah I, I don't know if she's gonna but she probably should <laughs> <laughs> you think she should yeah hang around with these weirdos what does she expect i just have a comment on the fact that this woman had to write this book to get this dream out she really should spend time figuring out better things to do with her time. Well, I'm sure that you will be dismayed by all of the time that she has committed to writing the entire series and a few spinoffs, all of which you'll be able to find on her website that I will link in the description below. Without the spinoffs, this is a five book series. And then five books, how many pages per book? They're pretty thick. This book, I think, was like 490 pages. 490 pages for one book? <laughs> and I read 10 pages and almost fell asleep? I'll have to check that. I think uh, it was for... An so what if it was 350? I would be still just as amazed. <laughs> <laughs> There's got to be something better to do than both read and write these books. She actually had a lot of disdain for novelists. Cotrain writes about this in the Guardian article. She went to Brigham Young, the university, for English, and she would never take a creative writing class because she felt so pressured by all of the great authors that she had read. And whenever she would meet someone who was like, I'm aspiring to be an author, she'd be like, who do you think you are? Well, if her disdain existed before she started writing, I can't imagine what she feels about it now. Well, she originally wrote the book for herself. She didn't intend for anyone else to see it. This is going back to the Weintraub interview in the Collider. I did not find out what actually led her to share her work in the first place with other people. She sent out 15 different proposals to 15 different editors, got one yes. And Cotrain says by 2013, the book sold 100 million copies. It had been... 100 million copies? <laughs> it has been translated into 37 languages. I, I'm stunned. There can't be that many dumb people on this planet.
This has been made into a film series. Jesus, Mary and Joseph. According to Wikipedia, the film series has grossed $3.3 billion. I think you're lying. Your son saw it. My son saw what? The movie? He might have seen the whole series. I'm calling the jerky son I've got, straightening him out. (laughs) So what do you think about the rest of this book? Can you assume anything about maybe the plot? I alluded to the fact that Bella is in high school and now she's hanging around with a bunch of weirdos. So no, that's the first I heard she was in high school. Yeah, that came from me. So what else do you think happens in this book that maybe not be mentioned here? I mean, I, mean, I, I can't even imagine. I mean, when we get through playing baseball and the people are running at 150 miles an hour, I mean, the, the mind just boggles at what else could be going on here. Good Lord. <laughs> So you got the sense that you were very much removed from the main plot of the book. Yeah, by, yeah. I mean, if we're going to measure this in years, you know, we're talking centuries. Yes. You're not assuming that this is entirely a baseball weirdo drama with Bella. No, of course not. This is something much worse. (laughs) I mean, oh my gosh, she sold a hundred million copies. I can't, Jesus, I can't, come on, a hundred million copies? Yes, 100 million copies. I don't believe you. You're so full of shit. Contrain says, critics have referred to her books as abstinence porn. What does that make you think? Abstinence porn. Yeah, I could, yeah. You, yeah. I mean, this is right <laughs> up there with abstinence. Oh, boy. <laughs> I'm with the, whoever said that. Yep. I mean, this is like putting your finger in a vice and just keep turning the handle. Um, she was also accused of being sexist in a lot of her works. Did you see that at all here? No, I only had 10 pages. So in The Guardian, um, the author responds to accusations that she is not a feminist. She said, I love women. I have a lot of girlfriends. I admire them. They make so much more sense to me than men. And I feel like the world is a better place when women are in charge. So that kind of by default makes me a feminist. What do you think of that? Well, I mean, she can be anything she wants after we wrap it all up in being weird. Yeah, she actually explains a lot of her plot points in terms of the character's context. Someone would say, well, why did you write the character like this? And she'd be like, because the character has this background. This happened in The Guardian. She didn't really want to make political statements. She was actually accused of sending anti-abortion messages, which I also think it's built from the fact that she's also a Mormon. Brigham Young is a Mormon college. So I think that also might have come together. Later on in the series, um, Bella gets pregnant and like she breaks like four ribs. <laughs> what the hell does the one thing have to do with the other? Or was it, is it violent sex? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to deny the first thing. The second thing is that she is impregnated with a weirdo, so to speak. I figured that much. Yeah, right. (laughs) What, he's growing so fast she's breaking ribs? Exactly. Oh, shit. That's horrible. This must have been the climax of the whole book. I mean, according to Cotrain, this series had people sobbing at the panels where the author was being interviewed. I went through at least a half a box of Kleenex just reading 10 pages. Are you serious? Of course not. I was, yeah, well, I was going for the Kleenex because it was hurting so bad. I had tears in my eyes. So you cried yourself to sleep if we put all the pictures together. I, I, yeah, I'm wordless. I'm, you've, got, you've killed me there. All right, Grandpa. So you read Twilight by Stephanie Meyer. Oh, God. If I only knew what that meant. You're not really familiar with this series, so to speak. I'm not. But again, remember, as soon as I hear, you know, Werewolf or anything else that's strange, I close the book or I turn off the uh, Kindle or whatever I can do to quickly erase it from my memory. So you're fine with science fiction, but you're not really that on board with anything fantastical. Right, because science fiction takes no thought whatsoever. You can be a blathering idiot and want to read science fiction. That's why I enjoy it so much. But you can't read fantasy. No, because it's just, it's so mesmerizing that you can't, <laughs> it is just takes you to a different level. And I'm telling you, I can't cope with it. It's just beyond me. 
facetious. I'm being facetious. Okay. Sometimes I get a little lost in, in what you're meaning. Do you have any like burning questions about the rest of the excerpt? Are you at any way curious or do you want to burn this excerpt away from your mind for the rest of conceivable you time? Put it perfectly. I, the last part, I want to burn it from my mind. Yes. All right. Well, this has been Book Club Blind Entry. Thank you so much for listening. My name is Casey and I will see you next time with a new co-host. Thank you.